uh, all of our mailbox and uh, does a head school day extensive early in the morning. So the answer uh, this afternoon with our, our uh, continuation of the meeting uh, to see what the best time might be so we're getting people out here. Anyway, I'm going to start with a uh, the, the talk on, rent, uh, on Nathaniel Macon, and I apologize that uh, we don't have our our scheduled speaker, Dr. Wilson, with us today. He's got a, a, a vocal cord condition and is acting up, and he's trying to save it for the uh, Stephen Doe Lee uh, School, which will take place on March the 1st. Clyde was kind enough to allow me to deliver his, his talk, and I asked him that after I had read it. First, I was going to shuffle some things and uh, have something else uh, take place uh, for this first segment. But after reading his talk, I, I realized that, you know, I just can't hand this out as a... As a as a handout, as he suggested, it had to be delivered. So I asked him permission to do that. So, like the uh, like the person who read Clyde uh, uh, Calhoun's speech in 1850, because he was too weak, I'll be reading uh, Clyde's Clyde's talk about Randolph uh, Nathaniel Macon. He's trying to say Randolph Macon. Randolph Macon was named after him. Actually, Macon uh, Georgia was named for Nathaniel Macon too, which I found interesting. But he was a well well loved person. So I will begin now. And keep in mind that I'm reading. Uh, per Clyde, so there's some things that are proprietary to him in this, as we begin this talk. The title is Nathaniel Macon and North Carolina Independence, and of course this is by uh, Clyde Wilson. He starts saying that although I have been in exile many years, I am a Tar Heel born and a Tar Heel bred, and when I die I will be a Tar Heel dead. My association with and interest in the North Carolina League goes back to its founding when I spoke at the first and most of the early annual meetings. He was a early, he was one of the founders, was he not? Yes. Uh, it was proposed that I talk about Nathaniel Macon. It is a perfect subject for this occasion. Nathaniel Macon is not well known today, but he is the best possible example of the true spirit of North Carolina. And comparing Macon with the politicians of today gives us a benchmark as to how dreadfully far America has degenerated from the principles on which it was founded. In his time, Macon was widely admired by Americans as the perfect model of a Republican statesman. And by Republican, I mean Republican with a small r. I definitely do not mean the Republican Party, which, from its very beginning, when it stole the name from better people, right up to this minute today, has stood for the exact opposite of what Nathaniel Macon meant by Republican government. I'm going to leave this off to the side if she tries to bring us a, a battery. The power is on, but nobody's home. It won't work. When North Carolina had occasion in the early 20th century to pick two figures to represent uh, the state in Statuary Hall in the U.S. Capitol, we chose Zebulon Vance and Charles Acon. At the time, it was natural to honor Vance, who had seen us through the horrible war of conquest waged against us, and Acock, who removed the last vestiges of Reconstruction. That's understandable although it overlooked Macon, who might easily qualify as the greatest target of all. Macon was born in 1758 on a plantation in Warren County, where he lived his entire life. He was a student at what is now Princeton when the War of Independence broke out in 1775. He left school and joined the New Jersey militia on active service and then went home and joined the North Carolina troops. It's like going to Duke and then transferring to North Carolina. But he was offered but refused a commission, and he refused also the bounty that was paid on enlistment, which is interesting. He served in the Southern campaigns until he was elected to the General Assembly near the end of the war while he was still in his 20s. In the next few years, he was offered a place in the North Carolina delegation to the Continental Congress, which he declined. It is noteworthy that, excuse me, it is noteworthy that his brother John voted against ratification of the new Constitution in both conventions of the sovereign people of North Carolina to consider the question, and that our state did not ratify the Constitution until the first ten amend amendments were in place to limit the federal government, especially the Ninth and the Tenth Amendments. As soon as the U.S. government went into operation, Hamilton and his Yankee friends, claiming that they were acting on behalf of good government, began to turn the government into a centralized power and money-making machine for themselves, by banks, tariffs, government bonds, and other paper swindles that would be paid out of the pockets of the farmers who produced the tangible wealth of the country. I'm sure you can hear Clyde in these words. <laughs> to this day, when I read anything by Tom Fleming, I can hear Tom Fleming's voice <laughs> speaking in my mind. 
He's got such a unique way of saying it, delivering. Now, to oppose this, Macon accepted election to the U.S. House of Representatives for the Second Congress. He served in the House 24 years and the Senate 13 years, representing North Carolina in Congress from 1791 to 1828, from the age of 33 to the age of 70 when he retired voluntarily. He was a Speaker of the House for six years, Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee in both the House and Senate, and finally President Pro Tem of the Senate. He received no, numerous overtures to be a candidate for Vice President and was twice offered appointments to the Cabinet, all of which he declined. During all his time, he never neglected his duties as Justice of the Peace and Militia Officer in Warren County. His last public service was to preside over the North Carolina Constitutional Convention of 1835, and he died two years later. The city of Macon, Georgia, Randolph-Macon College, and counties in Alabama, Tennessee, Illinois, as well as North Carolina are named for him. During all this time, Macon was admired because he never changed from the principles with which he began. What were these principles? <clears throat> that the federal government should be tightly bound by the Constitution. It should not tax the people and spend money any more than was absolutely necessary for the things it was entitled to, nor go into debt, which was just a way to make the taxpayers <coughs> pay interest to the rich. Eternal vigilance was a price of liberty. Power was always stealing from the many to the few. Office holders were to be watched closely and kept as directly responsible to the citizens as possible. A few words from Macon and Congress would often stop bills that proposed supposedly attractive features. It might be nice to pay for everybody to go to college, or to build a fancy temple for the Supreme Court, or to issue bonds for rich people to invest in, or overturn a dictator 5,000 miles away. But the politicians had no right to take away the citizens' earnings for whatever they thought was good. The Constitution told them what they could do, and that was it. History showed that the stronger and more centralized government became less free, as were the people. And the richer the government and the politicians and beneficiaries became, the poorer were, were the people. That was what had always happened, but America, with governments created by the people, had a chance to avoid the bad tendencies of government of the past. As time went on, Macon realized more and more that preserving true Republican principles was a losing cause. But in the company of John Randolph and John Taylor, he never wavered even when most of his fellow Jeffersonians were willing to yield some ground. 